So we're in the season of Advent at the moment. Today is actually the third Sunday of Advent. And I'm hoping that you have been following and I'm encouraging you to follow the devotions we're sending out as part of our Advent journey. They're go out on the WhatsApp groups. They're also available on the Victoria Road website. Um, so you can go and listen. And the reason why we're sending these out is to prepare ourselves for the coming of Christ. You see, Advent is a season that we celebrate every year. And so Advent prepares us for Christmas. But not Christmas of just looking back, but in a sense, understanding that what Christmas is about is the incarnation of God. God in human form. God among us. I mean, Jesus was called Emmanuel. Eh? The Bible speaks about Emmanuel, God with us. And so Christmas is a time where we remember what God has done. But it's also a time where we look forward to what God will still do. The second coming of Christ. That's what the Advent season is about. Is we look forward to that. Not only that, but we look forward. And it reminds us and it prepares us to start preparing for God among us now, already. Not just one day, but now. Remember Jesus says, eh? where two or more of you are gathered together, there I am. And he says, I will send my spirit. He will be with you, in you. We know these things. God with us. And so the theme we're looking at is an overarching theme for Advent season is what will it look like for Jesus to be truly incarnate among us? If Jesus is really living in us and with us, what should our lives look like? What should our communities look like? What should our churches look like? And so Advent season is this time where we create the sense of expectation. I want to say every year at Christmas time, Christ should be born anew within us. And so as we journey through Advent, Advent it's four weeks. It started the 27th of, of November. And and it calls people to this new sense of expectancy. And this Advent, Advent 3, tells that the Messiah, whom John the Baptist promised, is Jesus of Nazareth. And calls people to look to Jesus for redemption, renewal, and transformation. And so if if we look at that understanding of redemption, that redemption, transformation, renewal is found in Jesus... And, and we look at the fact that when we light Advent candles, which we need to start doing, I think. Um, you light the first week a candle of, let's see if we know, hope. And then we light the next week a candle of, peace. And then the third week is joy. And then the last week is love. Joy. The candle of joy. And I think it's appropriate that we celebrate joy this third week when our lectionary readings and our church calendar looks towards redemption. Because it's because of God's redemption. It's because of God's redemptive work within our lives we can be filled with joy. And the book of Isaiah speaks about that. And our Psalm 2 speaks about joy because our hope is in God. The Old Testament passage from Isaiah deals with, with an anticipation which, of God's redemptive work in the life of Israel, which creates a sense of joy. The book of Isaiah is written um, over various stages, and is, and, and, but, but the part that we dealt with today is in the later part of the 8th century, um, where Isaiah prophesies to the nation of Judah that 
They need to change, that calamity is coming, that there are problems. He prophesied during a time when Judah was threatened by external forces. First the Assyrians and then later the Babylonians. And during this time, Isaiah constantly <coughs> prophesied, said, warning the people to change. But they don't listen. We know these things, don't we? Um, and then what happened is, they're going to exile. Eh? The Babylonians come and overthrow them and take them into exile. And, 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 and the beautiful thing about Isaiah, there's three parts to it. There's first Isaiah, which is chapter 1 to 39, and then second Isaiah, which is chapter 40 to is it 60, somewhere there. Fifth, yeah, I think 60, and then 60 to 65 is third Isaiah. Um, but but second Isaiah deals with hope to those already in exile now. So even though they went into exile, God didn't abandon them there. God spoke about a restoration. In fact, in first Isaiah, which is where our reading comes from today, God's already promising restoration even before the exile happened. In the space of warning, God says, there's hope. God says, I will redeem. I will restore. That's what the whole streams in the desert is. This highway of God is where God is saying the people will come back out of exile, back to Jerusalem. It's a book of hope. It's God speaking hope to people. It's God not just speaking, well, hopefully one day things will get better. No, God is saying, I will. I will redeem you. I will make a difference in your life. And that, he says, must lead to courage, to joy. And so most commentators agree that this passage from Isaiah that we read in chapter 35 speaks about the time where the Jewish people will be returned from exile in Babylon and wherever they've been scattered and come back to Jerusalem. We as Christians also understand that restoration, the day of the Lord, to be a time at the end of time eh? where Jesus will come back. That's how it ties up with our Advent season. Jesus will come back when there's the new heaven and the new earth. It's what God will do. God will restore where there will no longer be any dying or crying, no more tears, no more pain. And so both John of Revelation as well as Isaiah speak about a time where God will restore. In the midst of calamity, in the midst of difficulty, the prophets speak about a time of restoration, about God working in our lives, bringing about renewal and transformation and redemption. Understand that prophets are not fortune tellers. They don't foretell the future, but rather they foretell. They speak God's truth in situations. Because we know that God is a God who loves, a God who redeems, a God who transforms. And so the prophets say that even though we go through difficulty, we go through bad times, God is still working and God will make a difference. God is continually busy transforming our broken world. And, and, and this leads to us experiencing the sense of joy. We no longer need to live lives of despondency. Because honestly, if I have to ask you seriously, if we look around us, we can become depressed, we can become despondent. Not so. Life's not easy. People make decisions which have huge ramifications and impacts on the lives of many. People's greed affects nations. It's so easy to become despondent. I don't know if you experience in your own life, there are moments, there are phases, there are seasons where no matter what you try, it just doesn't seem to work. Eh? And it's so easy to become despondent. 
But because of what God has done, God, what God is doing and what God will do, our lives are not futile. Max Lucado in his one book writes, he says, our lives are not futile. Our mistakes are not fatal. And our death is not final. Because of what God does, nothing that happens in our lives that is perceived as negative has the final say. Evil does not have the final say. Because God is busy. God has not given up and God will not give up. And so the prophet says, Isaiah says, say to the people, strengthen the weak hands eh? and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Yari is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. The prophet is saying to this nation that is facing exile. They are surrounded by enemies who want to destroy them. The prophet is not saying that don't worry. It will all be okay. You know. He's saying no it's going to be difficult. These people are going to drag you off. But God's not going to abandon you. And so be courageous. Strengthen the weak hands and the feeble knees. Mm? And those who are of a fearful heart, be not afraid. Be strong. Be courageous. Why? Because Yar is your God and He will come and save you. Yar is your God and He will come and save you. And that puts what makes the difference. And the problem is, though, is we can become now so future focused, eh? Because one day God's going to come and save us. Or we become so past focused when God did something that we don't really live in the year and now. Have you ever come across Christians who all they speak about is one day in heaven? One day when Jesus comes back. That's all they focus on. In fact, they get so caught up in it that they start making predictions and every little thing that happens, oh, this is the end times and, you know, all of these sort of things. But we lose sight that God is already here now. I'm not saying that Jesus isn't coming back with power and might. But whether he does that tomorrow, next week, next year, a thousand years from now, doesn't change the fact that he's here now. Doesn't change how I should live my life day by day, moment by moment. Doesn't change the fact that in the worst of situations I can have joy and hope because of God's redemptive work in my life. It says John Wesley said on his deathbed, he said these words, the best of all is, God is with us. Eh? And that's what makes all the difference. God is with us. No matter how difficult, no matter how bad it is. God is with us. God has done work in the past. Through the salvific work of Jesus on the cross. God is with us now. Through the indwelling spirit. And God will come again. Christ will come again and restore all things. And so we live with this and this must fill us with joy. That no matter how bad things get, we are secure. And because of that, we need to start changing our present reality. We no longer live out of fear and despondency and hopelessness. Bliss, what? Hopeless. We're no longer hopeless. Let me rephrase that. We have hope. We have joy. It's not always going to be perfect and it's not always going to be easy. And that's why I like our New Testament reading. Here's John the Baptist. Eh? John the Baptist is in prison. And he hears what Jesus is doing. 
This is John the Baptist, who in his mother's womb leapt when he heard Mary's voice. This is John the Baptist who saw Jesus and said to his disciples, There is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here is John the Baptist who baptizes Jesus after protesting and said, No, but you should baptize me. Jesus said, No, no, we must do it this way. John the Baptist, who I assume also saw the Spirit come down on Jesus like a dove, who heard the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. This same John the Baptist sends his disciples and says, Are you the Messiah or should we expect somebody else? I find that amusing but also comforting. Because even for John the Baptist, God doesn't always behave the way we expect God to behave. Eh? John's in prison. Maybe he's thinking Jesus would come and literally set the prisoner free. But he doesn't. And so he has his concerns. He has his doubts. Jesus isn't quite behaving the way John was hoping. And he sends his disciples and what does Jesus say to them? Go and tell John what you see and what you hear. Okay? The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news proclaimed to them. Jesus is saying to John's disciples, go and tell John the fruit of my ministry. Of my life. That's how we know of God's presence with us. It's not necessarily that things work out the way we would like them to or the way we expect them to, but is there fruit of God's presence in our lives? Personally, is there fruit? And 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 yes. I would love to raise the dead and cleanse those who are ill and open the eyes of the blind. And we pray for that. We do. And we trust God for miracles. But more importantly, is my, are my spiritual eyes open? Am I healed of my prejudice? Am I healed of my anger, of my bitterness? More importantly, do I show love? Do I love those who appear unlovable? Do I show other people that God loves me? You like come in, come. You can come in. There's a lot of kids there. <laughs> um, Am I showing God's love? Is there fruit of God in my life? Am I more loving today than I was six months ago, six years ago? Is there not the absence of sin, but is there less sin in my life today than there was last year? I hope so. I hope so. But these are the things, these are the fruit, these are the signs that God is busy in my life. That there's transformation happening. And in our community, in our church, are we a community where we can say the deaf hear and the blind see? Those who are ill are healed. The good news is proclaimed to the oppressed. In other words, are we a community that makes a difference where we are? At home, yeah, places of work or study. Is there fruit? And so as we journey towards Christmas, as we go through Advent, as we live with joyful and hopeful expectation of God's return, of Christ's return. I want to encourage all of us to put our hope in God. In God's redemptive work in our lives. 
in our communities. So I want to encourage you to renew your hope in God and allow it to create a sense of joy in you and allow that joy to become a sense of purpose, of strength, so that you too, if you're struggling with weak knees and feeble hands and fearful hearts, that you will take courage and that you will live lives that make a difference, that proclaim God's love to a hurting world. And remember... Remember that no matter what you go through, how bad things get, the best of all is God is with us through whatever we go. Let us pray. O God of Isaiah and John the Baptist, through all such faithful ones, you proclaim the unfolding of future joy and renewed life. Strengthen our hearts to believe your Advent promise that one day we will walk in the holy way of Christ where sorrow and sighing will be no more and the journey of God's people will be joy. God of hope, you call us home from the exile of selfish oppression to the freedom of justice, to the balm of healing and the joy of sharing. Make us strong to join you in your holy work as friends of strangers and victims, companions of those whom others shun, and as the happiness of those whose hearts are broken, we make our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.